Good afternoon, everyone. Can you hear me all right at the back? Great. So uh, my name's Edwin. This is uh, Miles Sabin. Um, that little um, faffing about here was because uh, neither of us has ever used a computer before, I'm afraid. And we were <laughs> we've, we've actually worked out how to get the thing talking, so hopefully nothing else will go wrong. Uh, for the... Oh, for... <laughs> um, you know... <laughs> Actually, I, you know, I'm just teasing. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, um, so, if you've used a computer before, you'll find this thing happens to you all the time. Uh, you're doing something uh, in front of an audience, and you try to make things go, and then something goes badly wrong. Sometimes it's a bit less serious, so uh, I'm uh, typing merrily away, or I'm browsing a website, and... and uh, Congratulations, Mozilla Firefox is not responding. Um, so this sort of thing happens. Uh, this sort of thing might happen if you're, uh, if you're out shopping. Uh, you put your credit card into the card reader, and, and you get a segmentation fault. Now, I don't know about you, but if the card reader is, is seg faulting, I don't particularly trust it with my credit card data. So what do you do when these things happen? I mean, this is, this is all computers going wrong. We're all kind of used to this now. I mean, the, way, the fact that you're laughing suggests that you recognize these situations. What we typically do is we turn it off and on again, don't we? And then we just carry on, and we're fine. Now, it's not always, um, it's not always going to work turning it off and on again. So are there any rocket scientists in the room? OK, that's disappointing. Um, <laughs> so does anyone recognize this? It's a spaceship. Well done. <laughs> yeah. is, is it one of the Mars uh, satellites that, it, that never made it into orbit? Yeah, so this is the Mars Climate Orbiter. That's actually an artist's impression of the Mars Climate Orbiter, because uh, I don't know if NASA advertised, but they were tr having trouble finding photographers who wanted to go out to the orbit of Mars. Uh, the other reason it's an artist's impression is uh, what it was supposed to do was go to Mars, uh, be a relay for the Mars Polar Lander, monitor the, the climate of uh, Mars and send details back to Earth. What it actually did was crash straight into Mars. And um, the, the, the reason it crashed was, was actually quite interesting for me as a type theorist. The reason it, it crashed into Mars was um, ground-based software that uh, w w was working in imperial units, and, and the orbiter itself was working in metric units. So this is, uh, in my world, this is a type error. I mean, in, 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 a, in any reasonable world, this is a type error. We're using the wrong types for these things. But in a, in a mainstream, ordinary programming language, this isn't a type error, because you know, they're both integers or floating point numbers or whatever. So what I'm going to talk about, and what we're going to talk about together, is how we can use types to help um, write correct software. I'm going to talk about it from uh, one perspective, from the, the Idris programming language perspective, the, uh, full dependent types perspective, and then Miles is going to tell us a bit about um, how this can work in a mainstream programming language. We can call Scala mainstream these days, can't we? I think that's, yeah, yeah, good. So type systems offer lots of things. So uh, we heard a lot about this this morning in uh, Martin Ogursky's talk. Um, so we, we, we present types as a way of checking programs for correctness, but there's a lot more to it than that. And it's, it's not just like you know, the, the type system is there to tell you off when you did it wrong. The type system is also there to, to help guide you towards a program that actually works. So uh, personally, I, uh, I do a lot of my programming in Haskell. So if I add a field to a data type in Haskell, what do I do? I add the field. I don't then go through my entire program searching for all the places where this uh, where, where this data type exists, I just hit compile and let the machine tell me uh, where I need to fix things up. And I find this uh, greatly helps my development time. Uh, also, types uh, are there to help us build some expressive libraries, to help us with generic programming. And we'll see a little bit of uh, examples of this uh, as we go on. So we're going to talk about dependent types. Type, dependent types are kind of, if, if, if you imagine the, uh, uh, the graphs that we had in this morning's keynote on, on type systems, it's kind of far off the top right uh, sort of, I think, roughly in this room relative to where the, uh, <laughs> where the, uh, where the slide was. Um, and I'm going to show two different, oh, we're going to show two different approaches uh, to programming with dependent types. It's basically types that are allowed to be predicated on values. And this could mean a whole lot of different things. Uh, precisely what we mean by that really depends on the setting that we're, we're working in. So I'm going to talk about Idris, which is um, a new programming language that I've been working on for, well, actually, a few years now, uh, where the idea is, We've got dependent types. How can we build a language from the ground up that is uh, general purpose, practical, usable for real stuff? 
And then in contrast to that, uh, Miles will show, you know, I'm, I'm going to set some challenges and I'm going to show you some Idris programs and Miles is going to say, pa, I can do that in a, in a mainstream language. What are you theoretical uh, geeks on about? I'm uh, no, okay. <laughs> He's too polite. We're both British, so we're quite, you know, polite and friendly. Um, so I haven't got the boxing gloves on that some people seem to expect. Um, Okay, so just to set the scene, uh, I'll give you some uh, examples of, of, of Idris programs. Now, if you're familiar with Haskell, uh, who, it's, who, who's familiar with Haskell uh, around the room? Ah, brilliant. That's, that's actually most of you. Uh, so um, if, you're, um, if you're familiar with Haskell, a lot of these examples that I show you uh, in the Idris notation will be quite familiar. You'll notice a few tiny differences, and I'll, I'll, I'll draw your attention to them as we go on. So firstly, um, natural numbers. Uh, this is obviously, uh, so natural numbers can be either zero or the successor of a natural number, so, you know, just counting a pile of potatoes, I suppose. Um, and uh, obviously this is a completely mad way to represent numbers on a computer because uh, maxint takes about four gigabytes if you, if you store it this way. But uh, we, do have, we do have some optimization tricks to make that work a bit better. But the reason we do uh, describe uh, numbers in this way is that they have, the, the, you, you can very clearly see what the structure is you can see how the numbers are built up, and you can start relating them to other structures that you might want to work with. So here's one other structure you might want to work with that has a, a similar sort of, um, well, structure to natural numbers, so lists. Now, you'll notice here, I've, I've declared this data type in a, in a rather different style. I've said that list is a type construct. So this colon here is, is, a, is a, a typing judgment. So unlike Haskell, where you have a double colon for typing judgments, we have a single colon. Now, this, this is a kind of a... A sort of bike shedding sort of point. But the reason we have a single colon rather than a double is that I feel I'm going to be writing an awful lot more types. So I just want to hit the button once. And besides, mathematicians have been using a colon for the typing judgment forever, so why shouldn't we? Um, so list is, um, you can reread really this as a function type. It's, it's, a, it's a function from types to type. So we have an element type, and it just gives us a type. So nil, that's the empty list. Nil is a, a, a list of some element type A. And then cons, so I've got a double colon for the, the, the cons constructor. Given some A and a list of some A's, that'll give us back another list of A's. So that's a fairly standard way of presenting uh, uh, linked lists. So what about dependent types? Well, we can relate, um, we can give this very precise relationship between data types by giving it a dependent type. So a vect, a vector here, we, uh, unhelpfully we call them vectors. It's, it's, it's standard in the dependently typed literature, so li basically lists with size. So a vector is uh, indexed over a, a nat, which will represent its length, uh, and an element type. So now we explicitly say that nil has zero things in it. And we explicitly say that given some element and given some vector of k things, I'll give you back a vector of successor of k things. So nil and cons, we've used the same names because we're going to use a lot of differently decorated uh, uh, list data types. I don't want to come up with you know, 100 different names for these constructors. And they'll, they'll just get disambiguated by the type checker. Now, if we have um, types indexed over other types, so those, those types have a, a, a strong relationship to some other type, then it follows that any program we write over those types is also going to express that relationship. So append here, uh, we have an input vector of length m, an input vector of length m, and an output vector of length m plus n. So if I somehow manage to write this append function in a way that doesn't preserve that, that, that length property, I'm going to get a type error. Uh, so there we go. Uh, uh, empty list plus y's is y's. X cons x is plus y's gives us x cons x is plus y's. So you, you can read the program just like any ordinary uh, program that you might write uh, in a functional language such as Haskell. Maybe a bit more interestingly, um, uh, we, can, we can have um, uh, a function such as this, this vector addition. So it's pairwise addition uh, of vectors. So corresponding elements in vectors uh, are going to be added. Um, so we've got a vector of n things going in, another vector of n things going in, and it has to be a vector of n things that comes out, otherwise this won't type check. Um, this, this constraint here, num a, well, uh, if you're a Haskell programmer, you'll recognize this as a type class constraint. So we have type classes. Uh, it just means that the a's have to be something we can do numeric operations on. Now, one thing I'd draw your attention to is that uh, I only have, I have the two inputs here that are nil, two inputs here that are cons, and there's no point in me giving the cases for, you know, nil added with cons, cons added with nil, because, well, they're not going to type check. So if you've, ever, um, if you've ever written something in Haskell using something like zip with, 
you might find that you know, you've got two lists of different lengths, and you don't get the, the type error until runtime uh, if your lists don't happen to be the same length. So zip width, we can write two. Uh, zip width is pretty much the same thing. It's just that we've lifted out the function. So we have higher order functions as well. Um, and yeah, it follows the same structure. Uh, now, here's the key thing that uh, when, when, we're teaching, uh, when we're teaching people functional programming, we often say things like, ah, functions are first class now. Well, in Idris, types are first class. So you can compute with types just like you can compute with anything else. So we don't actually have a different type language. So one thing that came up in this morning's talk was that as you get richer type systems, your, your type language gets more complicated. Well, it doesn't have to, because all we do is we use exactly the same language. No problem. So here, what we're doing is we're calculating a type from the, the, the function I'm trying to write here is a, a sort of variadic adder. So it's, it's an adder uh, that takes a number of numbers. And I'm going to say in the first argument how many, numbers I'm going to, how many more numbers I'm going to take. So if, a, if it's a zero, then I'm not going to take any more arguments. I'm just going to give you a nat. And if it's a successor, I'm going to ask for another number and return the rest of the type. So the function, the adder function, looks a bit like this. Uh, adding zero to an accumulator just gets the accumulator. So this, uh, we, we've, we've, we're, we're sort of calculating the type from this first input. So this n here is bound here and returns a new type here. So actually, it's probably best if I just show you these things running, um, because then you might actually believe this language exists. You don't really need to see my Twitter um, uh, feed, do you? Uh, let's turn that off. Or, or read my emails as they crop up. Um, so um, here's our adder. So um, you, can, you can download and run this if the wireless is working, by the way. Just type cabal install Idris and then you know, tell me about all the errors. And if you're just playing with that, then I don't really mind if you don't listen to Miles. <coughs> <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, did I say that out loud? Um, so here's our adder program. Um, and I guess I could just run that. So if I type add of four, it gives me the type of add of four. So it's expecting, it's actually expecting five more things because I'm giving the accumulator two. Uh, so there we go. Oh, no, it's expecting five more things. Um, there we go. If I give it too many more things, it says, well, you can either read this as it went wrong, um, or you can sort of mentally say that, you know, turn those into NAT, which is that it doesn't have a function type. So we've got some basic ideas here about how to write programs with expressive types. We can, we can calculate um, function types so we can be more generic, and we can... Um, I'll swap over now, and I'll, I'll pass over in a minute. Um, and, and we can um, give precise um, uh, types that, that make sure our program is correct. So, um, can you do that? Uh, do you want to take some questions? <laughs> yeah, let me, we, 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 we've had a bit of an issue with his computer, because I have a Mac, so it worked. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so if there's any questions while we're swapping, then... Uh... Oh, uh, yes, sorry. <laughs> uh, are there any kind of limitations on the uh, types you can describe? Uh, well, your imagination, really, because you can write any... Uh, well, okay, two answers to that, I suppose. The first one is just your imagination. The second is, well, the, the, you have to be a little bit careful not to allow too much in the types, because if, if you put a program in a type that doesn't terminate, well, that means your type checker isn't going to terminate, and that's, you know, not ideal. You can just hit Control-C, of course. Um, uh, so we do, have a, we do have a restriction that the, the only things which the machine is certain terminate can go in types. But that's about it, really. That's suddenly lots of hands have cropped up. So you were first, I think. So what is the performance of this thing? Because uh, as far as I understand, some of the dependently typed things, they, they move to runtime. Right? Ah, well, that, that, um, that opens a can of worms. And I would be happy to talk about that for the next two hours, but I shouldn't. Um, really, we have more precise types. So the compiler knows more about what the program's supposed to do. So that should be good news. And it almost is. It's just, it's a research problem. Uh, so I did my PhD on this. So it was, a, it was a topic I worked on for a long time. So I have done quite a bit of work on type erasure and, 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 and removing things that aren't, run, aren't there at runtime. And in practice, we find the performance is OK. Uh, but yeah, and it's, it's an interesting topic. So you, you've had your hand up for ages. <laughs> Yeah, so you can just calculate it um, based on some other input. So, um, I mean, typically you'd have a function calculating the length, and then you'd put that in your type. So, um, can abstract over that sort of stuff? yeah, you can abstract over that sort of thing. In fact, I've got things just like there's a tutorial for Idris, and it's got things just like that. So, um, how are we doing? 
We're just about there now. Oh, brilliant. Okay. Um, um, so I just wanted, just wanted to um, uh, excuse Linux. Actually, it's not really Linux's fault here. The problem is that I'm actually running xmonad as my window manager, which, of course, as everybody knows, is written in Haskell. <laughs> Okay, so what I'm going to do first is I'm going to sort of uh, do a little, a little demonstration of, of uh, the, uh, the vector types um, that uh, Edwin was talking about um, previously. So I've translated um, Edwin's extremely succinct code, so succinct that I think basically if you blinked you, you would also miss it, into Scala, which is, which is somewhat more verbose but not... Not appallingly so, let's put it that way. It's, I, 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 I reckon that the, um, the, the, the code size uh, increase is, uh, it's a constant factor, let's put it that way. Um, <laughs> but actually, 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 um, if you think about it quite carefully, that's, that's actually a win. I mean, in terms of what, what's being expressed uh, by the types here, we have types which are indexed by, uh, by, 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 by natural numbers. Um, you know, that's potentially the, 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 the expansion is, 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 is arbitrary. Um, uh, linear, potentially linear in the size, <laughs> size of the, the list you might be working with. So the fact that we can keep the code expansion to, to, to a constant size, and actually something which is not totally illegible, um, which does have some relation back to, 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 to the sort of the succinct um, first class dependently type stuff that uh, Edwin showed us, I think, I think is actually, is actually um, quite remarkable in a language which is, uh, is as Edwin said, a, ma a mainstream language like Scala. Okay, so let's take a look at an example of a, um, a size checked list, and let's just try those, uh, those examples that, uh, that, those functions that Edwin defined. So I'm just gonna type in uh, a couple. I've used um, a slightly different uh, constructor, uh, cons, Constructor here because Scala already has whoops, uh, Scala already has uh, a double colon cons constructor, so we're having a, a little hash in there for uh, for uh, oops, for uh, to indicate numerics. Okay, so we can immediately see there's an interesting type appeared on the um, on the on the REPL here. Um, it, I've actually found it would be quite nice if there's some way of abbreviating type signatures on the REPL because they do tend to blow up quite quite severely. Okay, so you can you can see there that what we have here is we have a um, we have a, a cons list type. Uh, so the colon uh, colon hash colon is that's that's the type constructor. Uh, we can see that it's the, the element type is is an integer, so it's indexed. So that's the, that's the elements of, of the list, and you can see that we have a um, a type which looks remarkably similar to, to the uh, to the, the, the numeric the natural number types that that Edwin. Uh, mentioned on his very first slide. So we have uh, an initial zero. Uh, because we are, are not uh, in living in a world where we can share uh, elements between the, t the value level and the type level, we have to invent uh, a, a new constant, a constant type underscore zero representing uh, the natural number zero at the, at the type level. But then having got that, uh, then we just uh, iterate the successor uh, uh, type level successor function uh, across that to get to uh, the, the correct number of elements for the list, which is, um, it may actually look like this is a list of length two, uh, because you've got zero successor successor. Uh, it actually turns out that, um, that um, the way you could read this type as encoded in, in, in Scala, the, the, the actual cons element is as an integer uh, prepended to a list of two elements. So this is in actual fact corresponding to a vector of type. Uh, uh, with with three elements, okay. So let's let's um, now add. Uh, let's have a uh, let's give that a name. Okay, um, uh, L two is uh, let's have let's be uh, boring and unimaginative with this. Okay, uh, and now if we do uh, L1 um, concatenated with L2, you can see we have uh, a now even more exciting type. Um, <laughs> so we have, um, okay, we, we, have, we, have, we, have, we have the list exactly that you expect, and you can see that its length has been encoded in, 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 in the type. So we have an additional couple of uh, applications of the successor type constructed to our, to our zero to get us up to a, a list of length five. Um, just do a quick uh, v add example. Um, so if we were to do uh, L1 v add, 
L2. We hope that this will fail. It should do, uh, and fail not in the sense of a, a runtime exception. It should fail with uh, it should fail with a compile time error. And goodness me, it does. We have a type mismatch. Um, so let's do this again. Let's take um, L3 is. Um, what should we have? Let's have six stuck on the front of L2. And now if we do that, success. So um, that's demonstrating, that's demonstrating the, the way that, um, uh, demonstrating that, that, that the types are actually, actually doing some useful work for us here. They're verifying that the, the property that we're hoping, uh, we're expecting to hold does actually hold. Um, it works reasonably smoothly. There's a couple of other things which kind of drop out of this quite nicely as well. Um, if we take a look at L2, that's a two-element list. One of the, I mean, as, as well as the sort of very typical problem of, of, of trying to zip uh, differently length lists together, a, a very common problem is, is attemp attempting to take the head or a tail of an empty list. So something which drops out of this kind of representation immediately is, is, is the fact that attempting to do that uh, becomes a, uh, a type error. Now, this one will succeed. Um, as indeed oh, this one, but if we do it again, because remember this is a two element list, uh, it's a type error. It's not a runtime error, it's a type error. Okay, so what I'm going to very, very quickly do is, I'm not going to go into very many details of the code because unfortunately there are lots of fiddly little details which relate to the way in which the encoding um, of, of uh, Edwin's, Edwin Code's maps into the Scala, which I, I, this, this is not the right time, I think, or place to, 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 to discuss the, 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 the quirks of the encoding. I just want to show you uh, a couple of uh, relevant lines of the code which, which will map very directly onto the Idris that, um, that Edwin showed. Just bear with me for a second while I try and find the right screen. I was going to say that was, ah, oh, I did go so well. Right, that's fine. Okay, so, um, so basically the way that, that this ends up translating into, um, uh, into Scarlet is that we, we, we actually end up representing um, the dependently typed functions, functions which are, as well as computing values, are also computing, uh, computing types. Uh, we represent those as uh, abstract types in Scala. This is, this is, I think, the most straightforward way of doing it. Um, and then um, the abstract type, uh, rather than doing the sort of the pattern match case analysis type um, uh, implementation that, that Edwin uh, demonstrated with Idris, we end up uh, resolving the independent cases using, using implicit resolution. But Aside from the um, aside from the 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 the, the, the additional verbosity uh, in, in in the scarlet, it, it is essentially doing exactly the same thing. So this is the the, the um, encoded signature of a dependently typed function from uh, x's and y's. That's our two um, uh, sized uh, two vectors of of of, uh, of, of values, um, and uh, we are going to be computing from them. Um, a value of some uh, result type. The result type itself is, uh, is going to be a vector of the element type uh, with um, uh, the uh, computed sum um, uh, type, the sum of the, the, the lengths of the two constituent lists. And you can see here that this has basically been left abstract. And the way to read this, I guess, is if you, if you could just imagine sort of folding the individual lines up, reading it as a single line, as kind of, kind of, a, kind of a dependently typed function signature with, um, with this, this, um, this component, the, the type being part of the, if you like, the output of the function in the same way that the value is, is also a part of the output of the function. And again, I think what Edwin's saying about sort of merging the two levels and only having, only having to have one is some, somewhere else where, 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 where he, he wins in terms of simplicity. Okay, so for, for this concat case, we have two, two cases. We have, we have um, the, 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 the empty, concatenating an empty list with a, with a non-empty list. And you can see in this instance, we are, so we have two, our two arguments. The first is, uh, is, a, is an empty list of A's, and the second is uh, a list, 
uh, with n a's. Uh, we can see that we've, we've set the, the, the result type is going to be n because uh, uh, 0 plus n is n, and the, uh, the result value is, is the second argument. So that's, that's the, if you like, the, the base case for our, our induction. And then for the, the, the vcons case, um, again, this code actually, if we compare this, this bit <laughs> here to what Edwin had on his slide, <laughs> It's actually pretty much identical. Um, <laughs> now, okay, I, I, we, laughter aside, this, the fact that we can do this in Scala at all is really quite remarkable. I think I think people should should um, not 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 uh, not. Um, not uh, scoff too much. I mean, it, there really are very, very few. I mean, you can encode this kind of stuff in Haskell. Haskell has recently grown the ability to sort of promote types, uh, uh, to pr promote uh, data types from the, the, the value level to the type level, which makes kind of this particular thing uh, a lot easier. But until then, actually, the, the Haskell encoding isn't much less heavyweight than this. And, and the Haskell encoding, uh, even with data, uh, even with uh, data type promotion, I mean, it, it covers a small number of ad hoc cases, and, and the, as soon as you stray outside of those, you end up back with stuff which is not far off from this. But anyway, I digress. So, so very briefly before we go back to Edwin, the 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 the, um, the, the recursion case is um, is again fa it's fairly straightforward. This time, um, again, due to some of the quirks of the encoding, we actually need to um, uh, produce a uh, if you like. Uh, uh, um, um, a witness for the uh, concatenation applied to um, uh, the, 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 the tail of the first list. Um, and there, are, there are certain ways that Edwin is able to kind of just basically get by with structural recursion that, that can't be done here, and I need a, an explicit, uh, an explicit, implicitly uh, constructed uh, proof term for, for the tail of the list. But that's basically what's going on. So we're, we're just doing exactly the same thing that uh, he's doing. Uh, we're, we're taking the head of the first list and uh, sticking that on the, uh, the recursive concatenation of the, the tail of the first list with, uh, with, with, with the second. And that will eventually wind us back down to the, to, to the nil case. And the, the main thing is that we can see is that uh, we're both computing the value and we are also computing um, the, um, uh, the, 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 the new size of the list. So we are, because we've just peeled off one element from the first list, we're saying that the size of the resulting list is the successor of the size of the concatenation of the tail. Um, and that, this incidentally, um, most, of, most of what I'm showing you here is, is stuff that you would, um, it has uh, Connor McBride doing this kind of thing in Haskell has described as, as faking it, faking dependent types in Haskell. Most of what I'm showing you here actually is, uh, is faking it, the sort of the type classy sort of approach to doing it. But things like um, this, um, the, 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 using the, the type member of the implicitly summoned value, that's a genuine Scala dependent type, that's a path dependent type here, and that's kind of a, a key element of, of the encoding. And sort of the joke I like to make about this is that in, in Haskell, um, uh, people use uh, type level functions to to encode uh, dependent types, whereas in Scala we use dependent types to encode type level functions. Okay, I think back to Edwin. Okay, um, so I think it's great that this even works at all in Scala. It's, what he's done is quite impressive, but none of <laughs> none of this is getting our spacecraft to Mars, or uh, I mean, it's, it's the, the the correctness is is of, of you know, functions is one thing. It's the correctness of um, the non-functional stuff that, uh, that, that you know, really gets interesting. So, um, I think I'm just gonna go straight to the demo rather than, uh, um, so, something that, something else we can do is, is reason about uh, non-functional properties, extra functional properties, so resource usage protocols. So, for example, if you want to read from a file, read the contents of a file printed out to the screen, a certain number of things have to happen in the right order. So you have to open the file, you have to open it for reading, you don't have to read it, you have to print to it, you have to be in a context where you can print, because you know, maybe you're running on, a, on an embedded system or something, uh, or, um, and then ideally you'll close the file before you've finished. And this sort of thing, well, okay, files we typically get right, um, I say we typically get them right. Idris had turned out to have a resource leak bug where a file was being left open for a while. So, you know, these things do happen uh, if you're being a little bit sloppy. Um, I like dependent types because I'm just sloppy and they tell me when I'm doing things wrong. Um, so, um, I have an example here of a... No, this is just to prove that uh, it really is checking. Um, 
So I have uh, an example here of a program that, that, satis that satisfies a uh, resource usage protocol. So this, this is a program which uh, opens a file, reads from it, uh, prints the contents, prints the number of lines, and then closes it. Um, now, you might say, where are the dependent types there? I don't see any dependent types there. And I will say, isn't it brilliant that you can't see any dependent types there? It's full of dependent types. The dependent types are actually inside, managing the effects you have, managing the state transitions, and making sure you get them right. So uh, if I scroll up to the top here, see this mysterious F line. It says, OK, a file program is something that runs in a side affecting environment. It's allowed to do file I.O., and the file I.O. is in this state. So that state can either be empty, open for reading, open for writing. Uh, we, ha we are allowed to do I.O., so we can do console I.O., and we can count as a labeled state. We have a, we're carrying a state, which is an integer, and we're counting the number of lines. So in this program down here, I'm allowed access to all of those side effects that I've declared. Now, this F language is it's just a huge abstraction over all of the possible um, transitions we can be doing, all the possible side effects uh, that we're making. Now, uh, if I type check this, then, well, it uh, takes a second or two, but then it type checks, and it's fine, and it works. And I can, I can even compile and run it. Um, I've prepared a file, so it actually does print the contents of the file uh, in a straight format, but never mind. Um, now, what happens if I forget to close the file? Now, normally, oh, you just compile and run, and you never notice. What happens here is it says, well, error messages are hard. So I print them in two ways. This first one, in this case, you might as well read that as it went wrong. The second one <laughs> zooms in on the actual problem. It says, can't unify empty with a file that's open for reading. So your clue there is, hmm, I have something open for reading, and it shouldn't be. So the dependent types here are just giving us that, uh, th that safety in, in, in resource usage protocol, safety in state management. And this sort of state management comes up in, um, in APIs all the time. So, can you do that? <laughs> so, um, yes. Do you want to take some more questions? OK. <laughs> Any questions? Yes. Yeah. It's not specifically about resource management, but you said earlier that even though you're using the, um, like the church encoding of numbers, that actually you were going to do something more efficient behind the scenes. Can you speak at all to like, how your runtime does that, like, what sort of limitations are? I mean, if I, if I want to use like, you know, more than a 64 bit inch, then how does it sort of it's quite simple, really. It's uh, underneath it's GMP, so GMP integers, and it's a it's a it's a uniform translation of patterns and values. So every time it sees Z, it puts O. Every time it sees successor of something, it translates that to n plus one, and every time it sees plus, it translates that to the plus function. So also underneath. Um, uh, the, the, it sort of promotes from an integer to GMP, like a machine engine to GMP if it gets too big. So I haven't really measured that performance. In general, I find that it doesn't really matter that we're using unary numbers because they tend to stay at the type level. They tend not to end up in the resulting program. So, um, yeah. Right, you know, so... Minutes, um, so. <laughs> So uh, Edwin sent me the challenge of translating his, uh, his uh, effects DSL uh, to I'm amazed by this, by the way. <laughs> um, and I, I, because I, I've, been working on, I've been working on my, my, my library Shapeless uh, for quite some time, and looking, reading, reading through his paper and looking at some of the things that were involved in it, I, I had a hunch that, that it would be possible to do it. Uh, I didn't think it was going to be particularly pretty or particularly easy, but I thought, I thought something, something would be doable. So I spent, um, I guess, somewhere between a week and a week and a half kind of banging, banging, banging my head on, 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 on the Scala type checker, trying to see if I could actually get it to do it. I got close, but I think ultimately, ultimately, uh, ultimately I failed. Um, it's not a terrible failure uh, in, a, in the sense that um, the, type, the type system is actually strong enough to, 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 to express the properties that, that Edwin's capturing in his effects DSL. The problem actually is in type inference. Um, there, are, there, are, there, are, there are a whole bunch of type, type annotations here which are needed um, because the, 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 the compiler just simply isn't able to work them out from its, for, for, for itself. And uh, unfortunately, I think my, my gut feeling is, although, although this, is, this is pretty cool, I don't, I don't think it is uh, actually practical uh, in use, except maybe in some very, very specialized circumstances, because, because the, the, the burden of the type annotations is too heavy. So, okay, so just, just showing, what, I'm not showing you any of the implementation here. This is, this, is, this, is, this is what a user would get to write. So people... <laughs> Uh, okay, so this is, this is obviously, 
I'm, I'm sure I, I can see Chris, Chris, Chris Nutty come sitting in, 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 in the audience. He, he, will, he will write, he will write I.O. Uh, or he will write code, code in this kind of monadic style sort of quite, quite comfortably, but maybe, maybe that's not for everyone. Um, but this is, this is essentially, essentially the kind of stuff that, that, that Edwin showed you. Um, this is a much simpler, well, this is, a, this is an example of just simply um, composing two, two independent state monads together. What it's doing is it's traversing a tree, it's counting the number of leaf nodes and, and labeling each node as it goes. Um, it, it, it works. I don't think I need to actually run it to, to, to persuade you that it does. So the, the, the crucial things that we've got here are that you can see that whereas in, if you were just saying using the Scala Z, um, uh, sorry, Scala Z, I beg your pardon, seeing as we're here. Um, uh, state manager, you, 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 would, uh, you, would, you, would, you would you would basically pack all the elements of your state into a single state monad rather than trying to run two separate state monads independently, or, or you would use some other mechanism to, to, to disambiguate. Um, here we're able to, um, to, to, to compose a state, so we can see our state a little bit further up. Uh, is ah yes it's here. So this is this is roughly speaking corresponding to to Edwin states. We have a, here a composition of two uh, two integer states, uh, and they're distinguished by um, uh, by uh, a couple of a couple of uh, a couple of labels effectively, which which allow us to 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 pick them apart. So there you can see that the um, uh, in the case of a leaf where we're updating the uh, the uh, the the uh, the count of the total number of nodes. Sorry, the the we're updating the the label, um, is that right? No, we're updating the count, that's right, and, and, and the leaves don't get labeled. And in the case of the, um, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the non-leaf nodes where we, we are both um, recursively uh, labeling the left and right, uh, labeling and counting the left and right, and we're also uh, uh, updating the labels and updating the counts as well. Um, so the, the interesting thing here is that, is that you, you can do things like sort of arbitrarily swap the ordering of, 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 the, of the uses of the uh, the uses of the different state monads, which is which is which is you know you, you would end up refactoring monad transformer stacks if you're doing this in, in another kind of mechanism. So I, th I think Edwin's effects DSL is, is is definitely a very interesting interesting uh, construct. Now the real problem here, and the reason why I, I think this is a failure, is that you see that in every step I actually have to mention the type of the whole, the entire row of resources being managed by the effects uh, DSL and, I, and I, I, I personally think that I mean I've kind of hidden it away a little bit by, by sticking a type alias on it but ultimately I think I think I think this means uh, Edwin wins this particular contest <laughs> okay so I think we're about to get you know dragged off with a hook or something so I'm gonna put the final slide up and then and then leave the final word to miles um, this was meant to be on all, all on one machine, by the way, if you're wondering what. Uh, uh. So uh, we're actually going to leave the, uh, the result of this to you, you know, who, who wins this battle. We, we like to think that uh, dependent types are the winner because I say we're British and we don't like to win. Um, so... <laughs> Um, so if you want to play with Idris, you can find the web page, Caban install, ought to work. Uh, if you want to play with Shapeless, it's all available on GitHub. And um, do we have anything more to say? Well, I, 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 I was very, very impressed with... Um... <laughs> um, so I, I, I spent I spent a week and a half, uh, I guess, uh, working with... Um, uh, translating, uh, attempting to translate Edwin's uh, effects DSL uh, from Idris to Scala. I was very, very impressed with Idris. I thought Idris was was a really very interesting language. I really enjoyed the way that um, it managed to combine really very significant increment of expressiveness uh, with uh, with really being a, you know kind of a programming language you, you would actually want to write programs in. Checks, I suppose. Checks in the post. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I, I, I think my, my, my takeaway is I believe I believe that dependent types are the future. I think I think that uh, at least in the, the part of the fork of fork in the road that we're going down between the the, the, the dynamically typed and the statically typed people, I, I think that our, our future on the, the statically typed um, fork in the road is inevitably going to be dependently typed. I think Idris is um, is a, a very interesting pointer to where we are going to be ending up, and I think Scala is interesting because. 
because it provides us with a platform that we can actually start playing around with some of this stuff. Uh, we can do it now. It does actually do useful things. There's a whole bunch of the, um, the techniques that, that have been in play in, uh, in me attempting to translate Edwin's uh, Idris DSL at, at, in use in my, in my um, uh, Scala generic programming library, Shapeless. Um, and uh, I, 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 I'm somewhat surprised and, and, and flattered to know that there are, there are quite a few people out there who seem to think Shapeless uh, does uh, useful and interesting things for them. So dependent types are already in use in Scala. People are doing things with them. I mean, aside from the fact that it's intrinsically dependently typed in, in, in its own way. But there are things that we can actually do with this that are interesting and important and useful. And I, I, I encourage everybody to, to think dependent types. Okay. Thank you for your attention.